Hi, this is Jim Patrick, and this is a Portland Press Herald podcast. We're talking today about opioid addiction and our lawmakers' response to that, both on a national and a local level. We're here with Eric Russell. He's a Press Herald reporter, and Eric worked on the uh, 10-part opioid series called Lost that appeared in March. And Eric, welcome uh, to the Press Herald podcast offices. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get rolling, Eric. I have actually got a few questions. You know, there's a, a rule in reporting. You're not supposed to ask questions you don't kind of know the answer to, but here's one that I don't know the answer to. When did this problem sort of start on a national level? What, what time frame are we talking about this problem starting? I mean, I think, you know, uh, the simple answer is, you know, illicit drugs have always kind of been a problem. Um, you know, the substance has changed, but you know, addiction has been around forever. Um, I think if you're looking at the current crisis, which is opioids, we're talking about prescription opioids like um, painkillers, Oxycontin, Vicodin, things like that, um, to more illicit um, opioids like heroin and now fentanyl, which we're seeing a lot of. I think that started to take hold nationally maybe in the Mm -hmm. mid-90s. Certainly we saw a lot of it in Maine in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it started in large part because of doctors and others prescribing prescriptions, prescription drugs for, you know, pain, for chronic pain, for post-op surgery pain. Um, And they didn't realize at the time how habit-forming or addictive these particular painkillers were. And it wasn't until, you know, there were all of these pills on the market um, in people's medicine cabinets, in people's homes, that, you know, policymakers started to realize that they were terrible that you know they were really had before me and then they caused all these problems and I think you know one of the reasons we saw a big switch from prescription painkillers to heroin is just simple economics um, painkillers became once they realized there was a, a big problem they started to crack down on prescribing them so they became harder to get mm-hmm. and more expensive users who were um, addicted to painkillers prescription painkillers even if they didn't want to shift to heroin, they did because they were addicted, and they did because that's what they could afford, and that's what they could find on the street. So I think that kind of um, is how the crisis uh, evolved here, both nationally and in Maine. It's interesting to me that it's an economic issue uh, as much as anything. It used to hear about people breaking into, or breaking into a CVS or a Rite Aid or holding up a pharmacy and trying to uh, steal hydrocodone or stealing suboxone or something like that. And, and now we're on to uh, people, you know, it's just cheaper and more effective to go buy it on your street corner than it is to uh, go to a pharmacy or go to a doctor, right? Sure. I mean, it's fascinating. You think of um, when the opioid crisis was was more pills than than heroin or more painkillers that a doctor could prescribe you. It, it didn't seem as big of a problem, right? It seemed like, oh, right. this is something I can get from my doctor. It's not so bad. And there there's a certain sort of, I don't know the right word, but there's a certain sort of like seediness to, to heroin use, the needle, people yeah. under under uh, uh, an overpass or in an alley, you know, there's a very, that was always sort of the feeling about heroin use. And what we now know is that it's not really that anymore. I mean, sure, there's always going to be an element of, um, an element of that. But I think, you know, the people that have gotten into heroin addiction, opioid addiction, um, I mean, the, the dynamics have changed considerably. It's not you know, typical street people or the pejorative, you know, junkies um, that people would think of of the past. It's, that's just not the reality of it anymore. Well, it's interesting you say that because I, my thinking up until maybe a couple of years ago was if a doctor prescribes me something, I'm going to toddle off to the pharmacy and I'm going to fill that prescription and then I'm going to do what it says on the label. I'm going to I'm going to follow the instructions that were given to me. And then this last fall, I had my wisdom teeth pulled out and I got a prescription for 20 or 40 hydrocodone or something like that. And I thought to myself, I don't even, I mean, I I guess I'll get the pills just in case there's some pain and there wasn't any pain and I never, I didn't take any one of them and I gave the pills back recently to at a drug give back program. It changed my thinking. Is it, have you seen any of that in your own life? I mean, Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think people are definitely um, a much wiser about yeah. taking yeah. opioids in the first place. And I think doctors are much more wise about prescribing them. I think back 10, 15 years ago, doctors, in some ways to no fault of their own, but in some ways, you know, they bear some responsibility too. And a lot of doctors I've talked to will tell you that they feel a sense of responsibility for, in some ways, if not creating this crisis, um, worsening it. But I think they definitely think a lot harder about 
who they prescribe to, how they prescribe painkillers, and you know, making sure people are aware of the risk because you, you just don't think that you know somebody who's prescribed um, a painkiller for wisdom teeth, for a kidney stone, or a, just a simple surgery that that could lead to you know heroin addiction. But that is one of the most common stories we heard when reporting the law series is this is how people get started on something legal and they don't know that they're addicted until it's too late. And the, the stat that jumped out at me as we were reporting this series is that 60 to 70 percent of heroin addicts started as they were a prescription from a doctor. They got a prescription and that's what started their addiction to heroin. Yeah, I think that's the that's the best estimate that that uh, experts have come up with. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, not everybody starts out with a legal prescription necessarily. I mean, you hear about um, you know experimentation. Oh, that's a good so point. this could be yeah. you know you're a teenager, um, you're you're in school, and you know that your dad or your mom has some leftover. Percocet from something and you're talking about it with your friends and they say oh let's you know that'd be cool to try with with X and so that might be how it starts too you know but this idea that people you know go from zero to heroin no doesn't happen it just doesn't happen so uh, you, as we talk about doctor prescriptions being part of that there was just some news this past week I believe that in Maine the prescriptions went down 22 percent or maybe it was nationally I don't remember Did- I, I think both I think um I think the national numbers show you that mo- most every state has seen a pretty sharp drop in the number of prescriptions given, and Maine is certainly there too. But the, I mean, it wasn't all that long ago, Jim. I think even five, six years ago, where Maine led the nation in per capita prescription painkillers. I wow. mean, we were, it's not a huge surprise. I mean, we're a blue collar, oh. older, older state. state yep. um, we, we had a lot of prescription painkillers just, I mean, everywhere, everywhere. And I think part of the response to the crisis has been to, to kind of crack down on that. And they've had some success. Now, that doesn't help the people who are already addicted because they've moved on to other things by and large. But the crackdown on prescription and the monitoring programs and all of the things that they've done on that end will certainly help fewer people get addicted in the future. But it, it doesn't necessarily help the people who are already addicted. So how bad is this as we talk about the people that are addicted and, and talk about what the reaction has or has not been from legislators. What is the scope of the problem? Is there any sense of how many people in Maine might be addicted to uh, heroin or or opioids? I mean, that's one of the things that we we found just really sort of strange and frustrating when we reported on this is that nobody really tracks it. Uh, And there's no real good way to track it, frankly. Um, The Federal uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration estimates that as many as 20 to 5 to 30,000 people could be... um, suffering from substance use disorder, so be addicted to a substance of some kind, not just opioids. That includes all substances. Substances other than alcohol, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yep, okay. yep. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if you're talking 25, 30,000, that's a significant number of, of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, nobody really tracks it. So I think, you know, one of the things that I found in talking to, to, to policymakers and to people who do this every day, treatment providers, um, doctors even, how do you address a problem if you don't know how big that problem is? And what we do know is that that problem is overwhelming the treatment facilities here in Maine, right? Oh, no question about it. So it's you know no secret that virtually all of the treatment providers are saturated, that they have waiting lists if they're um, traditional inpatient beds. You know, you go to a rehab facility and you stay there for a month or six months, uh, I think, is the maximum. But even the ones that you know you could get into, it's a matter of, of money. I mean, it costs a significant amount of money to provide that sort of treatment. And I think you know the the idea that we don't have enough treatment options for people, whether it's you know a, a bed or medication assisted treatment, something like Suboxone or Methadone. So we don't have enough of that capacity. But we also have. You know, so many of these people who are suffering from addiction just don't have good insurance, don't have any insurance, and don't have an ability to pay out of out of pocket for their treatment. How many how many beds are there even in this state? Is it a couple hundred beds that in a so, treatment facility? This is another sort of area where you'd think we'd be able to get better data, better information, right. um, and we can't. So, from uh, the state's perspective, you only have to be licensed as a treatment facility if you provide um, main care beds. So this is this is um, people who uh, have, have public health insurance, right? People who have government-assisted health insurance. And so for those facilities that provide um, 
services to people on main care, Medicaid. Uh, there are about 200. Okay. Give or take. Okay. And there are also some private facilities that are cash based facilities where, you know, they don't take insurance of any kind and you can go there if you have $20,000 to pay. Uh, there are any number of those facilities. I, I don't know the exact number because they're not regulated in the same way. But I mean, for all intents and purposes, those places are off limits to 90% of opioid addicts. And kudos for not saying intensive purposes. <laughs> The so there's this huge donut hole. It sounds like you're either rich and you can afford to send your kid or your spouse or whomever needs to get to treatment. You you can pay for it, or you're so poor and yet functional enough, right? Because you got to be able to actually get on main care and fill out the paperwork and everything. Uh, so there's this donut hole of people in the middle, which is basically everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's something like ninety. I would imagine ninety five percent of the state doesn't really have access to treatment or not much treatment, right? Yeah, or if they do, if they have access to it, it's very hard to afford, to afford it. Fair, I mean, I right. talked to a number of people who were admitted to uh, a treatment facility, let's say, maybe even a, 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 an inpatient residential facility, and they could stay there for up to X amount of days because that's all their insurance would cover, saying, oh, it's not medically necessary. And those people come out of a rehab facility after seven days, 10 days, don't have the skills and the sort of, the, they're not ready. They're just not ready to go back to to, um, to not using, and they relapse. What do you mean by that? that well, I mean, if you're somebody who, who can't get into um, a residential facility and can't get those skills that you need, and they send you out after a certain amount of time, and they send you right back to you know all of these places. Um, so you're not going to a halfway house, you're going back to your house? Or, very often. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people that I talked to who struggled um, to, to kind of get clean after a long time. They said the hardest part isn't, isn't stopping, right? It's, it's being around all of these environments and triggers and scenarios where it's just so easy to, to get back into it. And if you can't remove yourself from, from that, what, what chance do you have? You know what I mean? Well, that's, it, it's interesting you mentioned that, the triggers, because we were contacted by a number of people at the Press Herald concerned when we ran pictures with our stories about the opioid epi epidemic of heroin or of a heroin needle. That was a trigger for some people. They, they couldn't see those images of drugs. Yeah. And, and yeah. that opened my eyes. I, oh, absolutely. You know, I remember it was several years ago. It was before we did the law series, but the New York Times had come up to Maine to do um, – a piece on uh, on took the heroin a picture press. under the bridge near my house. Oh yeah, and they Portland. and they did a video, and they found somebody, and it was a very sort of um, jarring video, and it was of somebody using it. It was this, it showed the entire process, right? It's tying a tourniquet around their arm to get their vein. I mean, it was very, very graphic, and we even though that ran in the New York Times, I think we ran the story on our website, mm -hmm. and I, we we got a lot of pushback from that, and I remember hearing from a lot of people. Uh, in the treatment community, in the recovery community about, you know, those types of things are really, really dangerous. But it happens everywhere. I think, you know, frankly, you know, when you see police departments put out images of parents passed out from from drug use with kids in the backseat, I understand why police departments do it. But I think that's really dangerous, too, frankly. I mean, all that does is sort of perpetuate it further. And you're not, like, right. reminding people that they're suffering from a pretty serious disease. And what what is the scope? It's a, is, it's all over the state, right? I mean, we're not it's is it centralized anywhere or is it just It's not. I mean, one okay. of the things we found in our reporting um for the law series was that I mean, no no community has been spared from this. Um I think the the cynics will tell you that, you know, it really wasn't until this type of drug use uh, sort of branched out into the suburbs that people started to care. But there's a little bit of truth to that. I mean, once you started seeing, you know, kids of doctors, kids of lawyers overdosing and dying from this, then all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, it's not, it's not just a street drug anymore. It's not just, you know, these, these homeless people that are dying. I mean, these are like, these are doctors' kids. These are lawyers' kids. They're As if people. that could They're never have people. been the case. Right. But yeah, I mean, and one of the things that just, there were just so many just ordinary average everyday people caught up in this and i think probably one of the things that people have a hard time with they don't understand it if they don't they haven't seen it right. firsthand right. right in their own family a friend whatever it might be it's hard for them to sort of understand the power uh, of this type of addiction yeah and 
I thought our series, I mean, I'm biased. <laughs> I admit my bias. I thought it great, did a great job of humanizing the story. Of, uh, that was the goal from the yeah. beginning. I mean, we knew the goal was to, to exactly what you said, to humanize this, to show people these are the face. I mean, this is what's being lost. And I mean, you know, if you if you look at just in terms of like the numbers of people dying, it may not sound like a lot of people, but you know, these are over the course of three, four, five years, you know, a thousand, twelve hundred people, and they're all a majority young people, mm-hmm. people who didn't get to live a full life. You right. know what I mean? And I just, I, I'm struck by, I think we framed it this way. I mean, it's an entire generation uh, of people, young people just at risk to this. So we've teed this up in as many different ways as we can. There's a donut hole. Uh, people can't afford to get into treatment centers. There's not enough access to treatment centers. People don't know how to respond necessarily. If somebody comes, raises their hand and says, I'm ready for some help. Um, there's all these problems. And it sounds to me like this isn't a problem that's going to be solved by the medical community per se. You know, Maine Med isn't going to come up with this fantastic new 5,000 bed treatment center. This is something that needs to be indre- addressed, in my opinion, from a larger systemic standpoint. And that might be the Department of Health and Human Services. That might be the state. That might be the, nat- the federal government. W- has there been a reaction on that level in the last year or so? So the story that I did that ran a couple of weeks ago looked at, you know, what did the most recent legislature, the 128th legislature, what did it do? What types of things did it address as it related to the opioid crisis? And it's not that they did nothing, um, but they did very little. I mean, I think I can say without um, equivocating that they did very little. Well, they didn't spend any money, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, but even still, there are things that they could have done that would it have, wouldn't have cost money. And probably mm-hmm. the biggest thing or one of the biggest things when, when people overdose um, on an opioid, there's a period of time where they can, they can be revived. They, their lives can be saved. And we have seen a rise in the use of a drug called Narcan, which basically reverses the effects of an opioid uh, overdose. So Narcan has become more widely available. We know from, from data that we've gotten from emergency responders that they use it, um, I mean, just exponentially more than ever before. Mm-hmm. So if you think of you know, all of these people who have died, um, the increasing number of people that have died in Maine over the past few years, the number would be so much higher if not for the availability of this life-saving drug. There's still a resistance from many more people than is probably appropriate to make that drug more available. Um, so that's another thing that they can do at the state level. They can, they don't even have to, to pay money, but just you know, op- open up more opportunities. Yeah. But one of the things that was debated that didn't pass, they call it a, a good Samaritan law. So if I'm a, an injection drug user and I'm using, or maybe even I'm not using, but I notice somebody has overdosed, I might be reluctant to call 911 or call authorities if I have a gram of heroin in my pocket, or if I have drug paraphernalia. A Good Samaritan law- Because that's a felony, right? It can be, it sure. Can be, sure. Um, a Good Samaritan law, and it's worth pointing out that you know, dozens of states have these, basically exempts anybody or makes anybody immune from prosecution if they were to call in an overdose. Okay. It's, it literally saves lives. And they, they couldn't even pass that. So the governor's veto was sustained, as I recall, and I, it, was it a part? Of, it was a fairly partisan vote, if, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, I mean, all typically, I mean, the le- the way it's been under Governor LePage's administration has been, you know, if he vetoes something and it's sustained, it's because Republicans have stepped up and supported his his veto. So this veto of LePage was sustained. It's primarily a uh, Republican sustained veto, and uh, I guess it's still seen inside the le- legislature or by the governor, as described by a Democrat. Democratic member of the legislature, Patricia Hymanson of York, she said it's a moral, it's viewed as a moral crisis by some of these lawmakers. It definitely is. I think they're, you know, and I got at this a little bit before, I think if people haven't seen it in their own personal lives, they just can't sort of understand it. And I think for, for a lot of people, they just think, oh, you know, you made the choice to use drugs. And so it's up to you to, to sort of get yourself out of it. Um, while it's true that somebody has to make that choice the first time they use an illicit drug, the idea of choice when you're an addict is just, <laughs> it's just a farce. It's just, it's just not true. And yeah. so nobody chooses to become an addict. I mean, that idea is just, it's just, it's ludicrous. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants it. They're addicted because 
their brain chemistry has changed. That's how it happens. And so this idea of whether we should treat it as a disease, which doctors and experts acknowledge that it is, or this moral failing of, oh, you made a bad choice and you need to live with those choices. I think that sort of, that dynamic is halting progress. If you've got all these people on one side saying, treat it as a disease. If we spend money here, we're going to save money down the road, which is probably true. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a whole other people on the other side saying, uh, you know, no, it, you know, we're not going to subsidize your bad choices. How, how are you going to get anything done? I think, you know, there, there's, there has been a little bit of shift of thought. I think one of the people I talked to for this most recent story, Representative Karen Vashon, she's a Republican from Scarborough, you know, she acknowledged to me that even as early as a couple, three years ago, she probably would have been on, uh, on that side of things. But she's come around and she says, we need, we need to be, you know, whether we spend any money or any extra money at all as a state, the one thing we can do that costs no money is treat them with more compassion. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful message. Yeah. And, and I, I can tell you from reading uh, comments on our website and on Facebook and whatnot that, that that, what's the word I'm looking for, that compassion, that empathy is, is still not there just in the general population of people. People don't, pe people who maybe aren't even listening to this podcast because there's a presumed interest in, in this topic, uh, you know, people that are just sort of want to write things off and it's a black or a white issue, and this is not a black or a white issue. You know, one of the things that I think is really interesting as you talk about our response to this crisis, you know, it boils down to money for a lot of people and taxpayer money specifically. This idea that we're spending taxpayer money on treatment for a drug addiction. People have a really hard time with that. And I think, okay, but you're going to be paying for them one way or the other. You're going to be paying for somebody who overdoses and ends up in an ambulance or a hospital. You're going to be paying for them if they die. You're going to be paying for them if they end up in jail. Taxes support all of those things too. Why are we so, why is it so offensive that we would spend taxpayer dollars to treat them? Well, and these people also bring money into the economy. If they are not addicted to drugs, they're going to jobs, they're being taxed on those jobs, they have an economic value to the, to the state. Uh, just to follow up on your point, if, if we're going to follow the dollars and cents that there are, there is an argument to keeping people alive makes the state money in the law. Or it, even if it doesn't make money, it mitigates some of the loss of spending money on uh, treatment. And frankly, how much is a human life worth is the question that I keep ending up at. Sure, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's been some, frankly, some callous statements being made. I think, you know, you hear people saying, oh, you just let them die. One less person to worry about. And I just, I, I think, how do you get to a place in your life where you're comfortable <laughs> saying, let somebody die? Well, it's, it's, uh, the internet is a dark place, <laughs> and so that's the bottom line. Well, uh, real quick, I think we should talk about the national scene, and uh, as, as the Senate is currently debating changes to the ACA, uh, there's a lot of talk about money being thrown in as a, a sweetener to the pot, as it were, to uh, certain senators to get them on board. Uh, is there any hope down the road that the feds are going to come riding in with uh, $10 million to the state of Maine or $20 million and, and we're going to be able to have better treatment facilities or more of them and people are going to be have more affordable care? Is that on the horizon at all or what are you hearing? So you there is some money. Last year, um, before the change of administration, so during President Obama's last year in office, um, Congress passed a pretty substantial piece of legislation called the Cures Act, the 21st Century Cures Act. And it um, increased funding in a lot of different areas for different types of cancer research, Alzheimer's research. And as part of that bill, that budget bill, that funding bill, um, was a pretty substantial amount of money for uh, addiction treatment. So a lot of that money has now been dispersed to states. You know, one of the things that's hard to kind of get your head around as you think about this is that you know, there's always a lag in when funding is approved at the federal level and when it gets down to the states. And so if you're a treatment provider in Maine, and we've certainly heard from plenty of them, you're appreciative that there's more money coming through, but you're like, you know, we got people dying left and right every single day. So, you know, the sooner we can put some of this in, into, into, into use, the better. So I think, you know, there's still this thought among some who are on the ground seeing this every day that just that urgency isn't there it's just not there it doesn't seem like 
we can agree on much of anything, and that includes our politics on opioid addictions, unfortunately. All right, well, that's it for today's podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Jim Patrick, and this is Eric Russell. Thanks. Have a good day. This is a Press Herald podcast. You can hear past episodes at pressherald.com slash podcasts. You can subscribe on iTunes, on Android devices, and stream on Stitcher. Please email comments and questions to letters to the editor at pressherald.com. Thank you for listening.